Good morning um, and welcome everyone. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, on today's webinar, we will be covering um, Breaking the Disability Discrimination Act for Visitor Attractions and Experiences in Northern Ireland. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Claire McNaughton. I work within the Quality Assurance Team here in Tourism Northern Ireland. Um, we're delighted to be hosting this webinar and hope that you will find it informative and relevant to your business. An accessible business is one that is equally open to all potential customers. So including the approximately 400,000 people in Northern Ireland who have a disability. Providing better access means that your business is welcoming to everyone, enabling customers with disabilities, carers and people of all ages to access your services. We are delighted to have Una Wilson, a quality officer from the Equality Commission Northern Ireland with us today. And Una will highlight um, important considerations that can support inclusivity and accessibility for visitor attractions and experiences. Once we've heard from Una, we'll come back together for a question and answer session. So there is a live chat box there, so please feel free to add your comments and questions, um, and we can pick them up at the end. Um, and just before I hand over and she begin, over to Una, and she begins, I just want to remind you all that today's session is being recorded and will be available on our website www.tourismni.com later today. Anna, over to you. Thank you very much, Claire, for that introduction. Um, as Claire said, my role in the Equality Commission is to advise employers and service providers on um, uh, equality legislation. But today I'm looking at embracing the Disability Discrimination Act, visitor attractions and experiences in Northern Ireland. And we're going to be looking at it from a whole range of perspectives but before we start let's think about the fact we all like a good day out or a good night out or a good afternoon out and we plan the day we book it and we're all excited about it in so many different ways in terms of what are we going to do how are we going to do it what does that mean for us so i want you to think about the context in terms of how does that feel for your disabled customers? And Claire has made reference to the fact that over 400,000 people in Northern Ireland have a disability. Um, in the context of what we're gonna be covering today, I'm going to be looking, very looking at the aims of this webinar is to look at who are your customers? And we're gonna be looking at some poll questions around those questions about the purple pound. So you've often heard about different types of pounds, um, but the purple pound is the disability pound and how much is it worth to your business in Northern Ireland, but how much is it worth worldwide? And then we'll be looking at very briefly at the, the Disability Discrimination Act and looking at the reasonable adjustment duty in particular, in terms of what can attractions and experiences make changes to. And there's lovely good practice examples throughout Northern Ireland of them doing the right things and getting it right. And then we'll look at the customer journey and those are really about the tip bits and the kind of tips we would suggest that you look at, but they're obviously not a, an extensive list and, and hopefully this will be followed up by guidance at a later stage so that you'll have much more of an idea of some of the issues that are um, being pertinent today. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide uh, here. And I'm just saying, in the context of being open to everyone um, in Northern Ireland, who are your potential customers? And so we're looking at this um, slide and if anybody is joining us that can't see the actual slide, the slide has pictures of people with different types of, um, a man walking with a briefcase, um, an ear showing um, hearing loss, um, visual impairments, mobility impairments, wheelchair users, and somebody working with a pram. Providing better access is, that is, is more welcoming to absolutely everyone and enabling customers of all ages and abilities to access your service is, will widen your customer base. And sometimes the context is that we often thought about is that this is a, a little card which is from a suite of publications um, known as the Every Customer Counts um, that the Equality Commission produced quite a number of years back. So who is the typical accessible customer? 
They may have a medical condition that's not obvious. They may have diabetes, they may have epilepsy, they may have mental health, they may have autism. So there's lots of hidden disabilities as well that people need to consider. Can we put in the first poll question there, um, Barry, please? So if all of you would have a look at that, what do you think the disability market is worth per year in the UK? Okay, you can see the poll now, the results. So um, only 6%, that's interesting. So you all went for the middle one. That's what we all do with questions, isn't it? We'd always go for the middle one thinking that's the right answer. The right answer is 249 billion um, in the UK. So that is a considerable amount of money to be thinking about in terms of what is that market actually worth in terms of, and this is a further breakdown of this in terms of the business case for accessible tourism. Um, so this was um, a chart developed and it shows that 22% of the population in the UK have a disability. Um, 19 percent are over 65 and if we think about this in the context of um, uh, people getting older um, and that increasing six percent are under four northern ireland um, in actual fact the most latest uh, uh, statistics because i was double checking i should have changed the slide actually is 32.8 percent and it's broken down in the census by council area. So you might want to have a look at that if you're looking at it from a perspective of a council area. The Republic of Ireland says that they have a percentage of 14% and the European Union says they have a percentage of European uh, have 14% as well. So often um, they disable people face limited choices and increased costs. Um, so let's take the stress out of booking an attraction or an experience for people who are visiting Northern Ireland or own internal customers um, in terms of, um, and potential visitors have revealed to, um, that, that, that disabled people are not confident that they can easily ask the range, uh, access the range of experiences throughout. Um, so it is really important that you think about those in terms of those statistics. And I'm going to move on to the next slide here. So I just really wanted to talk about the context of um, disabled people want to have the same experiences as everybody else. And so do parents of disabled children, and they may have disabled children, they may have non-disabled children, and they want to have the same opportunities to access the same experiences. And also the context of older people who may have acquired disabilities, who want to have that access to, um, in terms of those issues. So that, um, in terms of those issues, the tourism related spending, we really want to look at the fact that access means business that 40 percent of all households in northern ireland include a disabled resident so the fact is is you're not only making your business accessible to disabled people but you're also making it accessible to carers you're making it more accessible to friends of disabled people and you're also making it accessible in the context of people who are don't have disabilities but the access changes will make a big difference to them accessing your experiences and activities so now thinking about that 249 billion and thinking about that um a lot of people don't think about the barriers for disabled people when they're accessing services and so i want you to think about um and you know better than i do that there is barriers in terms of accessing your services and you need to think about those in the context of the disability discrimination act and what we have is is looking at those choosing where to go and when you go on a, an opportunity should be a pleasurable experience it shouldn't be um and not only for the disabled person but also for their friends and families 
So going back to that context of every customer counts. So if we're looking at what are the barriers when, um, so the Equality Commission carried out some research on this issue and they looked at can uh, discrimination can be either deliberate or unintentional and it doesn't matter as far as the legislation and it can be made, it can be based upon assumptions and stereotypes about disabled people, prejudice or fear, lack of understanding and information or low expectations from the disabled people in terms of accessing those services in the same way as non-disabled people, a lack of contact with disabled individuals or groups, and communication barriers in the context of people with sensory disabilities in terms of accessing the service fully. Um, the example from our own, although it identified the following factors, not seen um, some of the issues around attitudes not seen or requiring extra help. The recommendations of the re research echo the themes we've been em emphasizing really, and that is encourage improved information provision, educate and train your staff, and encourage service providers to look at um, the access issues, whether they're policies, practices, or procedures, or whether they're physical features which would actually impede the person from enjoying the service in the same way. Um, so if you think about your experiences in terms of going forward, so just to remind you that goods, facilities and services legislation in Northern Ireland applies across all equality grounds, um, but we're going to be emphasising obviously the Disability Discrimination Act 1995, but it does cover and disabled people have other equality characteristics that need to be taken into consideration as do non-disabled people accessing your services. Um, but we won't be stressing those today. So we'll be looking at what is a disability. So I kind of hinted at that um, in terms of those issue. Um, we have a second poll question, but I'm going to hold back on that poll question yet because I really want to look at this one around disability. So a lot of people assume disability and some people don't even consider themselves disabled people, but they may have cancer, MS or HIV and they will be covered by the equality legislation. And the definition under DDA is physical or mental impairment that has a substantial adverse long term effect on a person's ability to carry out normal day to day activities. So in the context of your services, what do you really need to know? You can't ask people for identification, whether they have a disability or not. But um, what this will mean in practice is, is some of the effects of normal day-to-day -day activities that could be affected in terms of accessing services is the importance of um, where the accessible toilets are because individuals have IBS or their mobility impairments or they have other medical conditions which mean they need access to services that your um, provision may have in place. The other thing to consider in terms of um, uh, hidden disabilities is um, autism and um, mental health like anxiety and issues like that. So we'll be talking about those more. Um, I think really what we're talking about in terms of some of these issues in terms of disability discrimination is to look at who holds duties under the Disability Discrimination Act. So all of you are attractions and visitor experiences. A service provider under the Disability Discrimination Act is anyone who provides a service to the public or a section of the public and it doesn't matter if it's free or if it's for a cost and so that would include most visitor interactions and experiences um, in terms of those issues. There's certainly a little bit different issues around transport which I'm not going to go into today but if you have any queries on that feel free to contact the advice line on some of those issues. Okay. So what is unlawful discrimination? Uh, refusing to provide a service. Um, it is providing a service of a lower standard or in a worse manner, providing a service on worse terms. So that's extra um, imposing a worse terms would be imposing an extra condition 
or um, uh, in terms of um, uh, charging more for a disabled person to use your service because you put in accessibility would be an example of less favorable treatment. And then what we really want to focus on today is failure to comply with the duty to make reasonable adjustments or to provide auxiliary aids um, and services in the context of disability um, going forward. So the duty to make reasonable adjustments in terms of policies, practices and procedures is quite, um, is quite uh, wide and a lot of organisations often don't think about these issues. So what are your policies which could make it impossible or unreasonably difficult for a disabled person to access your service? And that might be a policy of going into a concert, being able to carry a drink that the person needs because of their diabetes. It could be a policy around assistance dogs, which are incredibly important to a lot of disabled people in terms of um, uh, health and safety reasons for um, they warn the person that they may have a seizure or they may have um, a diabetic um, incident uh, or they may be in the context of mobility or a guide dog or a hearing dog or a support dog for people with autism. So it is really about the importance of not excluding people in the context of assistance dogs. And we have a full guidance document which is in the support materials that Margaret has provided um, that the Equality Commission devised back in 2004. In terms of other practices and procedures, you should think about the context of um, your accessible toilets and making sure those accessible toilets aren't full of cleaning equipment. And no matter how many times I say this, there was a bit of a complaint last time saying I talked about toilets. Um, it is horrible to see the settlements that come through where an individual, it was really about making sure that the accessible toilets were open and accessible for disabled people because those are simple things that people can get right from the get-go. Um, so in terms of uh, other policies and practices and procedures you'll need to think about is your website accessibility, your apps if you're using them, if any of you are using VR in terms of your um, uh, experiences, you'll need to think about how you can ensure that accessibility going forward if it impedes the disabled purple from using the service in the same way as other people. Think um, provision of sign language um, at um, events is also another issue that comes up quite regularly um, in terms of um, an issue for deaf people in Northern Ireland accessing services fully. And so that could be using British Sign Language or Irish Sign Language, and that is incredibly important that you have procedures in place to ask that for information in advance and um, book them early. Um, so in terms of those issues, and there's a number of um, sign language settlements have, have been settled in the past against organisations for failure to provide sign language interpreters in various shapes and forms across the whole um, both the public sector and the private sector. So it is something that needs to be addressed in terms of those issues. And on a positive note, um, I don't know if I've grown up children, um, but they were all talking about Justina that was um, signing um, for Rihanna recently. So you begin to get a sense that it is becoming part of part and parcel of the whole experience for disabled people and non-disabled people alike in terms of those and um, truly lifting every voice um, in that context um, uh, was the example given in the um, publicity around that, a positive publicity. So I have a very short list of um, signs just to give you an indication. So one indicates British Sign Language, one indicates Irish Sign Language, there is the logo for accessibility of websites, the provision of large print. And if you don't provide large print, I'll talk about the alternatives in that context. So maybe you can't do large print and your menu is on a board. Having a member of staff reading it out and doing so in a positive manner 
having loop systems that actually work. If I had a penny for every time I have seen a loop system not working, um, not being effective, um, not being in place. Um, and if you think about that, that is a huge proportion of disabled people who would be using those and they wouldn't necessarily see themselves as um, disabled that have hearing loss um, as a result of aging um, and can just turn the T-switch to amplify um, in terms of those activities. Um, so I just wanted to go very briefly thing, what is considered reasonable? Uh, no definitive answer. It varies according to the circumstances of the service provider. And the factors can include cost, convenience, and the practicality of making the adjustment, the total resources of the service provider. The effectiveness of the change in making the service accessible is more accessible is probably the key one there. Um, financial assistance can be taken into account, but it would rarely be because in terms of service provision, there isn't a lot of funding out there in the context of that. This is not an exhaustive list and the factors will depend on all the circumstances of the case. So it will turn on so many different issues, but there is a merit of flexibility and the responsibility in terms of circumstances um, and turning on the circumstances on the actual day in terms of those issues. Adjusting physical features, can you remove the physical feature which makes it impossible or unreasonably difficult for a disabled person to use the service? Can you alter the physical feature in any way? Can you avoid the physical feature or can you provide the service by an alternative method? Now, some of the visitor experiences in Northern Ireland have um, come out really well. One in particular um, was mentioned in Hansard in relation to um, uh, a, um, a private member's bill in terms of uh, looking at uh, accessibility of, um, of, of, of theme parks and what they said was is one of the things what they referred to Titanic as a good practice example in terms of can you remove can you remove the physical feature which makes it impossible or unreasonably difficult for a disabled person to use the service? So that can be removing the steps to give level access. Can you alter the physical feature? So can you put in grab rails? Can you avoid the physical feature? And um, this is always my favorite one of, of saying the Linen Hall Library uh, historical building in Northern Ireland and the front door obviously can't be changed because for historical reasons but the side door became the main entrance and can you provide the service by an alternative method and that's in very rare circumstances although e all four of them have equal status under the law the code of practice suggests that you go um, you go through them in a step-by-step -step measure. Can you remove, can you alter, can you avoid in terms of those activities and experiences? So if there's physical features oh, going into your booking, um, into your main main features, those main where the experiences starts, is there physical features that you can look at? Can you alter any of those and can you avoid any of those in terms of going forward? Okay. Some of the physical features that are listed in the legislation are steps, stairways, curbs, exterior surfaces, paving, parking areas, entrances, exits, gates, toilets, washing facilities, light and ventilation, floor coverings and displays. And looking at the range of experiences that are available in Northern Ireland, that might be looking at, you know, if you provide a cooking course, could you have a have you, have you got lowered um, kitchen counselors that would be accessible for disabled people? And that depends on the size, size and nature of your business and what you can do and what you can feasibly do. Um, in the context of any exterior, um, like walks and things like that, that you provide detailed information on which part of the walks are accessible and which ones aren't. Um, and I was looking up the Giants Causeway one, and it's a great example of showing you where you can go and where you can't go, and um, was reviewed by um, disability organizations in terms of those issues. So, and that's not to say that it might be the same for everybody, but gives you examples of some of those issues. 
Can a service provider justify less favourable treatment or failure to make a reasonable adjustment? Um, and this probably only pertains to organisations that provide rides and things like that in limited circumstances, which are listed, but some which may be relevant to some of the visitor experiences, maybe the health and safety factors, the impact capacity to contract or the service provider could not provide the service to the public. The question really will be in the code of practice is, was the belief reasonably held or was it based on some stereotypical views of disabled people? And I'm going to refer to a case that was referred to um, in Hansart, um, which is the Houses of Parliament. And it was um, the case of Sebi versus the theme park. And he was going for his birthday um, and he's disabled with gross motor delay. Um, it's um, similar to cerebral palsy, he had a spinal injury, he had a double hip replacement, he was six years old, by the way. He, he gets intensive therapy to improve his mobility. And obviously part of his physical and mental well-being is that he gets to go on rides. And so his parents booked a ride months before um, trying to ensure the correct pass and let the park know about his disability. Um, but on the actual day, um, he, um, when he went for some of the um, parks, um, and this is an example of using that justification on health and safety inappropriately, the staff intervened to say he needed to show he could take three steps holding on to one parent. But it all took place in front of a very busy queue. He managed, but he was asked to repeat it by a manager. Um, and when he was um, when he was asked how did it make him feel, feel, he said it was so hard and it upset me. Um, so this um, was a private members bill in the Houses of Parliament and gained 26,000 um, signatures um, because around theme parks, ensuring the accessibility of theme parks for disabled people. So it is something to look at in terms of planning your um, developments within your um, within your um, within your various experiences to ensure the accessibility. And if you want to look at one of the ones that's been most successful in the world, and of course you're going to say they have a lot of money to do that, but they did it from the outset, and some of the costs are really around customer service um, which are not expensive in that context um, do look at the disney um, example what is considered reasonable so i think we've covered it in terms of the policy of the let it's not simply ensuring that some access is available to disabled people it is so far as reasonably practical to approximate the access enjoyed by disabled people to that enjoyed by the rest of the public. So I really want to focus on the positive stuff, folks, because I think we can all do better. I mean, after winning uh, Oscars in, uh, in Los Angeles, I think it's time to say, what can we do differently in terms of, and I was talking yesterday to um, the creative industries about um, employing more in disabled people. So I think equally in the context of looking at this issue from a customer perspective, um, it is really important. The other thing to bear in mind is there's a European Accessibility Act, which um, will be coming into force, not in Northern Ireland, but in other parts of Europe. And that will be harmonizing um, uh, legislation for both producers and service providers. And it will become law on the 28th of June, 2022. But the requirements must be implemented by the 28th of June 2025 and that will mean websites, mobile services, um, ticketing, information provision, payment terminals will all have to be accessible and we all know when customers come from other countries where there is greater accessibility because um, disability discrimination has been in place for a lot longer. Their expectations are heightened. Um, so if you're thinking about your American, your Canadian, your New Zealand, your Australian tourists, they're all going to be expecting and your European tourists are going to be expecting levels of access um, that you're going to have to really think about in the context of those issues going forward. Just want to look at the customer journey. So looking at your attractions and your experiences, um, 
Um, I went to the museum at the weekend and I looked and I saw an access guide for the exhibition. I looked at all the signage and it was all so positive and it was so brilliant. And I think we're really bad at telling people how good we are at these things. But what factors influence a person's decision to visit somewhere? Knowing you can get around and into the venue, 90%. So this is Ewan's guide. Knowing there is an accessible toilet, 80%. Knowing the staff are friendly and helpful, 70%. Knowing you can park nearby or you have a drop-off point. Knowing that you can get there on public or community transport. Knowing that information is available in an accessible format that you can use. And, and that's really crucially important because um, in terms of you know, if you do develop apps, that you make sure the apps are accessible as well as the website um, information that you're going forward with in terms of those issues. So we want to look at the three pillars, I suppose, of accessible tourism, which are information, facilities and customer service. So if we're looking at in the context of all of you, when you're booking your event or you're booking your cooking class or you're booking your event away in terms of, I don't know, your museum approach or your um, activity or concert, you need to comply with the website accessibility. That's a first starter starters um you need to provide options for the booking attractions online through your website and one of the things that people often forget about in terms of is provide detailed and accurate access guide to your visitor attraction and experience include photographs information on changing places toilets if you don't have a changing changing places toilet find out where your nearest one is and put that information in access uh, accessible places to visit and eat which are close by provide any prefer um any free information about uh, personal assistance policies and concessions um provide information about queuing processes so there was um a, a case in gb um around um child with autism queuing and how that um had an adverse effect on his ability to enjoy the attraction um and if you notice with all visitor attractions and accessibility you can have pre-booking systems in place in terms of those issues and um, one of my favorites is the tate gallery in london because they look at some of those issues from a by details about the actual experience and the exhibit so where can people go if they need a bit of quiet time if they have a child with autism or they have um, anxiety themselves and they just need a wee bit of quiet time where to collect the tickets um, where the drop-off points are as i've already said provide information about um, uh, asking for reasonable adjustments in the context of if you're organizing an event um, where they can get British or um, they can um, contact you about British or sign, British sign language or Irish sign language, whether the events are captioned, have a look at the Grand Opera House. There's loads of information about different things that they're doing. Um, the MAC is doing all sorts of things. And by the way, I'm not being paid by any of these organizations to do any of this. Um, I look at these things all the time and look out for them. Do be transparent about costs and charges for carers. If you're going to allow for carers, be clear about what that process is going to look like in practice um, in terms of those issues. Um, so a lot of people need that information before they actually make the decision. And I was talking to a woman who has um, a child with very severe mobility um, ish impairments and she was saying that more often than not even just booking santa claus is a is an event in itself in terms of trying to think is there an accessible toilet and she follows the change the uh, mobile changing places toilet to see where it's at because that's where they pick where to go so it makes you think about how those things impact on individuals in practice in terms of those issues Inclusive Communication Act. Um, so if any of you haven't seen the JAM card, which is a lovely social enterprise project which was developed here in Northern Ireland, 
it's just a minute and it's good for people with dementia, people with learning disability, people um, who may have um, dysphasia, um, may have communication difficulties. It means take just a minute. Um, and you may also see the sunflower um, uh, placards, which are being used as well in the context of people with autism. Um, they were developed in England. Ensure that you make sure that there's captioning and there's audio guides and that you um, have hearing loop systems and you look at the possibility of portable hearing loop systems. If you do have wheelchairs and buggies, make sure you know, you let people know where they can get them. Um, if you have information in accessible formats, make sure you have um, information, but also put up information to say that if people would like the information read out, that your staff would be very happy to assist in terms of those issues. I'm actually flying through this. I think I think I'm going on holidays myself next week. I don't know about all of you, um, but I do want to talk about inclusive communication um it's so important i mean we see autism friendly towns we see dementia friendly towns what does that mean for attractions and experiences that are in those towns and villages in northern ireland how can they be all of those things and a lot of people are very good at doing this in terms of those issues going back to those access guides we've already talked about those but they can't be emphasized enough in terms of both facilities about highlight the good practice examples so let people know the distances between the um the spaces within your guides make sure people know assistance dogs are welcome um have clear descriptions of your attraction um, and information about the attraction if external the surface the gradients the resting places, the lighting and the signage. Um, and I was talking to somebody recently where they asked them to take a mobile phone and do the distances between things and where could somebody go if they wanted quiet time? Where could they um, uh, take time out in terms of where were the, how far away were the toilets? How far away was the car parking? All those things are really important to people in terms of making decisions, the drop off points things that people don't often think about, but are really important to, to um, people with disabilities and um, their families and friends and carers. Highlight what facilities your attractions experience has and what it has not to enable visitors to make informed decisions. So make sure that people know how many accessible car parking spaces you have, how far away they are if you have um some people um obviously have um minibuses going which are accessible how accessible those are how the how really accessible the toilets are and whether you have changing places toilets and we have further guidance on the equality commission website on changing places toilets and and there has been a number of places where organizations that are organizing large events should be considering the fact that they should be putting changing places, toilets in place so that everybody can access them in the same way as other people. So I'm just, I'm flying through this this morning and normally I take a lot longer um, uh, in terms of those issues. Um, I'm just thinking, was there any cases that I should have referred to? And I'll come back to them just in terms of, um, I didn't talk about the platform lift one, which I might come back to in terms of accessibility. So in terms of those facilities, we've covered those and we'll look at customer service. Most issues can be alleviated by good customer service you're the experts on this you provide experiences and uh, attractions which make people live in awe or chat and um, as i watched my son's girlfriend cry at the one in the museum um because she thought it was so powerful was you know those are the opportunities to look at the context of how can i ensure and one of the things that really really stood out for me on that day was the staff were there and they were available to help 
and it didn't matter whether you had a disability or you didn't have a disability it was about them being clearly identifiable to help and can enhance the quality of that experience in so many different ways improve staff understanding of disabled customers needs you know it's more than individuals often think about wheelchair users and they're only seven percent of the population in the uk what you really need to be thinking about is the fact that there's a lot of disabled people who need access requirements and they're small and simple changes you could make to your service which would make a big difference to disabled people equip you and your staff with the knowledge to better inform your customers offer assistance and enhance your customer experience i think we're kind of over egging it but a bit, it can't be underestimated how much that um is important so when people are booking and um, one of the things you could actually do is is that you actually inform people that you know if they're using chat boxes or that you have an email address and one of the things we have put in the resource document, which will be going up, is, is how to have an accessible email, how to have, um, you know, in terms of ensuring that you give a named person who will be able to help the person if they want to have a conversation. A bit like that example from the, um, from the GB case there that I was talking about. But some of the cases really are about how do you ensure that disabled people access the service fully um, in terms of those issues. And a lot of people talk about some of the access issues in terms of facilities and they talk about the expense of them. And that depends on the size and nature of the, of the business. But if you're looking at it in the context of customer service, it's really important that we get this right in terms of, and also look at accessible feedback and complaints process. You have disabled people in lots of different organizations throughout Northern Ireland. There's autism guides, there's dementia guides, there's all sorts of guides about how you can enhance the service for them when they're accessing your service. So, um, and the other thing is, is you have members of staff who have experience of some of these issues who would be more than likely well able to tell you about how they, you could enhance your service in terms of making it better, but also ensure that you have disabled people giving you feedback about that process um, and asking you, what can you do to improve it? Um, because it is always about that whole sense. And I suppose one of the issues that I didn't really stress when I was doing the law is, is there's an anticipatory duty to make reasonable adjustments under the Disability Debt Discrimination Act. And that means that it's continuous and it's evolving and it's changing over time. As we all know, when the DDA was passed in 1995, I don't think we were even talking about apps um, and websites in quite the same way as we are now but all of those are part of the accessible experience. And it's about everybody being aware of how they can deliver that accessible experience. So we have a number of questions, so I don't wanna to take too much time here um, in terms of, really what I wanna to say to you is, inclusive and accessible communication is essential for customers with disabilities. And that can be print, that can be screen readers, um, you don't want to be Domino's Pizza where they couldn't um, they couldn't read the website um, and other customers making sure your apps are accessible um, access information about your action attraction and experience that helps them decide if they will book the experience and whether it's accessible for them. So one of the queries that you often get is is that you know, if you're organizing some sort of a jewelry making workshop or you're making a, your pottery thing, is to say to people, you know, please tell us if you have any access needs and we will try to accommodate you. Make sure you get an access done, it, audit done. It helps you to identify the barriers for disabled people accessing your service, including auxiliary aids and services. And I suppose the difference between an aid and a service is a service is a sign language interpreter, an aid is a loop system. Um, an aid can be a mobility scooter. Um, a service can be somebody who can guide a blind person. And one of the examples that I came across when the causeway um, was that, you know, 
sometimes they have a sign language interpreter, a voluntary sign language interpreter available um, um, in terms of those issues. That policy, accessible communication, but is it inclusive? So the crucial part is, it's not just about the accessibility of the service, it's about that disabled person feeling as included and as valued as a customer as any other person that accesses your services. And I have no doubt that uh, attractions and experiences in Northern Ireland can look at the opportunities that the Purple Pan presents to them in terms of opportunities to develop and continuously develop um, services and meet the needs of our population as we go forward from across the world. Thank you. Over to you, Claire. Anna, thanks very much. A really informative presentation there, covering a wealth of information. Um, you make wonderful points. Um, particularly about a lot of this, this information, you know, service users are wanting before they arrive on site. So look at your websites, look at any pre-arrival information you have out there and make sure that you're shouting about all the things that you do. Um, and some very practical advice in a right down to menu presentations, to the font size, um, to the countertop levels, to um, detailing if you have pathways and walkways. What is accessible and what is not? It's just about having that information and planning your trip accordingly. Um, really useful and really informative. Thanks again. Um, we have quite a few questions coming in here. Um, but before we move to the questions, I have a little poll that I would like you all to complete. Um, just two questions. So the first one is, do you plan to take any action within your business as a result of what you've heard today? And that's just a yes or no, please. And we have another poll question coming up here as well then. So how would you rate today's session in terms of content and relevance to your business, with one being not relevant three to five, which is extremely relevant? Great. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on to some questions here. Um, so in a, the first one um, is for yourself. So um, the question is, how do we work with the increasing number of requests to bring support or emotional animals into organisations? I suppose really, um, Claire, the guidance, um, we have a guidance document, the Equality Commission has developed a guidance document on this issue, which is available in the support information that Margaret has made available, is that assistance dogs are dogs that have been trained to work in partnership with disabled people to assist them in their accessing services and to help them improve their mobility, independence and quality of life. Assistance dogs support people with a wide range of disabilities, include visual impairments, deafness, physical disabilities, and hidden disabilities. Assistance dogs are highly trained working dogs. They are not pets, and the assistance dogs can be recognized by the harness and the colored jackets that they wear. A jacket will usually display the name of the organization that trained the dog in question. Um, there may be, um, and I suppose this is where the confusion arises, so there is um, there is a difference between criminal law duties and civil law duties, so this is the civil law duty, but there is a criminal law duty in the context of taxis carrying prescribed assistance dogs, and they actually prescribe them in detail. They've been trained to guide a, a blind person, have been trained to assist a deaf person, um, have been just trained by a prescribed charity to assist a disabled person who has a disability which consists of epilepsy or otherwise affects his mobility, manual dexterity, physical coordination or ability to lift, carry or otherwise move everyday objects. And when I was developing this guidance at the time, um, they had a picture of a dog, um, a mobility dog doing the um, 
the ATM and I was going, oh my gosh. Um, but the best one they had was the dog that put the laundry in and out. Um, I was like, oh, could I have that one? Um, but in the context of this, I suppose really what I wanna say is um, assistance animals um, on the civil law side, complaints to a county court in terms of the breach of the reasonable adjustment duty and the time frame on a, a, a reasonable adjustment duty case of six months. There's nothing in the text of the DDA that would exclude the possibility of a reasonable adjustment duty applying to other kinds of assistance animals. Um, um, there is a case um, going through. Um, I haven't seen an outcome on it yet um, about a cat accessing um, a support cat for a person with autism who has anxiety um, accessing a um, Sainsbury's. But the other aspect that you have to bear in mind is, is that you have to balance disability needs on this issue, Claire. So it's not as simple as that. You know, people may have respiratory complaints, which would be covered under DDA. They may have asthma. Um, so there is that context of, um, you know, getting it right in terms of balancing those issues. So um, there isn't a list as such um, and a lot of children now are using autism support dogs and they make a big difference in those children's lives but what you do need to bear in mind in terms of your customers is you need a well-trained dog that is going to behave themselves in certain you know in circumstances and obviously in the context of health and safety um, and that's where the case is at the moment in the context of Sainsbury's they were saying Yes, this cat is well trained, but other cats may not be as well trained and may not be able to um, facilitate those issues in terms of those. So does that answer the question? Is that enough information? Do you think it's really yeah, around that reasonable adjustment policy um, issue that people need to think about, um, not excluding people? So there's been there's 10 cases on the back of that uh, guidance document. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, um, you answer it well, and it, it's it's not a broad brush approach to this. It would be case by case, find out um, as much information and check from there, really. Um, but no, thank you. Um, our next question then: um, Does Tourism Northern Ireland have any investment or funding opportunities to support accessibility and inclusive tourism attractions? Margaret, I think that might be uh, for you there. Yeah, no problem. Hello, everyone. I'm Margaret Matthews from Tourism NI. So in terms of funding, so compliance with um, disability legislation already forms part of the funding criteria um, in a number of tourism NI grant schemes, for example, the Experience Development um, Programme. However, I am not aware of any specific grant aid to improve the accessibility of your attraction or experience um, from tourism NI or any other bo um, government body, unfortunately. However, just keep in mind everything that Una talked about in terms of the Purple Pound um, and the benefits of improving accessibility in terms of your, your markets. You know, a lot of families, older people who may, maybe don't see themselves as being disabled. So there is a market there um, for accessible tourist attractions and um, experiences, which in turn will hopefully impact on your profits. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Thank you. Anything you want to add in there or? Well, in the context, the context of all of this is you can employ more disabled people. <laughs> and if you employ disabled people, there may be access to um, grants to make your services more accessible for them as an employee. Now they will take into consideration the benefit that will have for customers. But at the end of the day, sends out a very, very positive message in terms of employing disabled people um, as well in terms of developing your service um, in terms of those issues. So um, there's things um, the Department for Communities have access to work, workable um, and other programs which um, may be applicable in the context of recruitment and a retention of disabled people in the workforce. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question here. What is the best way to publicise inclusive experiences or attractions? Um, either Margaret or Una. 
Oda, do you want me to start or would you prefer to? No, you go ahead. You go oh. ahead. I've talked <laughs> enough today. <laughs> so, um, definitely the most important thing to do is to provide information on the accessible features of, of your experience and for your attraction. Um, it's, as Una mentioned earlier on, it's really important to highlight what you have, but equally what you don't have. And that way the, the customer can make an informed decision on um, you know, whether your attraction will, will meet their needs. Having that information on your website is so useful. That avoids someone having to lift the phone, send an email to try and find that information out. So we would really encourage you to, to do that. Um, just to let you know that Tourism and I are hoping to develop a series of toolkits for industry. Um, it's early days, but um, basically these toolkits will assist you in providing um, information and to assess your accommodation or attraction um, to, to look at the physical and um, provisions of it in terms of accessibility, but we will keep in touch with you about that. Okay, so hopefully that answers. Una, do you have anything else to add on that? I suppose um, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, more and more organizations are putting in accessibility into their, um, you know, travel companies in terms of information around accessibility. So, um, you know, if you positive feedback from disabled people, so there's My Way Access in Northern Ireland and you've we've mentioned Ewan's Guide. Um, use those as positive things and if you develop stuff around people with visual impairment make sure you find out about talking newspapers and things like that because one of the um one of the outcomes of the american with disabilities act which i always found very interesting was is they trained everybody initially um but they never promoted that they had those services available um, so there's no point you putting in auxiliary aids and services if you don't yeah. tell the people that are going to use them that they're there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, great. Okay, we have another question here, and I think for yourself. So are viewing platforms at events, um, would that be classed as a reasonable adjustment? Depends on the circumstances and, and they can be. It depends on where, what sort of a, event that is and if that would enhance, ensure that the disabled person was having a equal um, access to a, an event in certain situations. Um, and also you obviously would have to carry out an access audit in terms of ensuring the um, safety of those issues in terms of making sure that the um, platform conforms with um, guidance in terms of those issues. Um, but I suppose uh, there was a case, um, and I didn't refer to it earlier, um, which was a case against RBS, and this was pre-bank crash, so days when uh, RBS had an awful lot of money, um, and there was a case of an injunction against a um, a bank for failure to provide um, a lift in that situation. But the, that's a very rare case, um, and there has been a situation in against a council in Britain more recently, where they removed um, a small platform lift in an actual of in a in a in a facility and um a disabled man took a case against the council for removing the lift and not putting one back in um in terms of uh, um that accessibility but you know it's very hard to say in a general terms but more often than not if if that event is not going to be able to be seen in the same way as non-disabled people, then you will have to consider it. And you'll often see them in stadiums and different places um, where there is accessible um, um, spaces for disabled people to see the services. Margaret, yeah. do you want to add anything? And I think you've covered that. Yeah, I think you've covered that. Um, great, we have one more question. Look, I'm conscious of time. Um, all your questions will be answered. We'll take one more um, here live and then we will follow up with the rest um, in written correspondence from both Inna and Margaret. Um, this one refers to your presentation Inna, and it's just asking if you could go back over the legislation that is to be put in place um, in June 2023 and to be executed by 2025. Um, 
Right, you that's the European work. accessibility legislation. Yep. It won't apply in the UK. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm going to have to refer to my notes on it because um, I didn't actually have a set of slides on it. Um, no I just put in some information. It's called the European Access Act. Mm -hmm. Um, it becomes law on the 28th of June 2022, and the requirements must be implemented by the 28th of June 2025. They refer to websites, mobile services, e-ticketing, information provision, e-commerce, payment terminals, ATM, check-in machines, um, and I don't have any further information because obviously the Equality Commission doesn't advise on legislation which is outside of the remit of our um, um, in the context. Perfect. Um, no, I suppose as a reference point or a website, you know, that we could maybe give if somebody wanted to get additional information specifically on this. Um, I'll find out about it because obviously yeah. it will become law in the Republic of Ireland, um, yeah. so I can um, access that. Um, no, that's fine. No worries. Um, as I say, the rest of the questions we'll answer in written format, um, and uh, if you've any further that you want to add in um, between now um, and then, please do so. Um, fire away. Um, thank you so much, Una and Margaret, for taking the Q&A session. Um, really good to see lots of interactions and lots of questions coming through. Um, just one final thank you from me. Thank you all very much for attending um, today. We will be sending you a copy of the presentation and the question and answers um, raised, and we'll also include a signed posting document um, that you should find useful. We will also be um, um, sending a link for a short evaluation, and we would really appreciate um, if you would take a few minutes to complete that um, so that we can keep evolving and improving our TED programme um, and continue to deliver what um, the industry wants and needs. Um, so, look, final thank you. Thanks very much, um, and enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you.